I had a very specific type of favorite person a couple of months ago. And you couldn't spot these people walking down the street. You couldn't think of some big stereotype and bandish them all with the same brush. You couldn't really spot them by even talking to them. The only way you could really identify these people was if you yourself were willing to have your mind opened and your ideas challenged and your thoughts really poked at. So who were these people? Well, these were millennials, like myself, living in London, who voted Brexit. <laughs> I don't think my clicker's working, though. So why are these people so amazing? She continues with the controversy. Well, these people were surrounded by colleagues and friends Apocalyptic post-Brexit headlines calling them bigots, racist, and assholes. And despite that, they looked at the facts and thought, you know what? I'm voting out. I think it is so powerful to step back, look at an institution, an ideology, a political movement, and actually go against the status quo. I have so much respect for those people, and I think it's getting harder and harder and harder to do this. We're sitting in our own individual echo chambers of information. All our ideas are being exacerbated by these self-reinforcing algorithms, and it's getting harder and harder to challenge the status quo. So I love to poke and prod and challenge things that don't get challenged very much. One thing we all have in common here is we're going to be users, if we haven't already, of healthcare. And nothing deserves more prodding and poking than our NHS. So, I will leave this slide up for you to examine what the NHS is, and hopefully you've understood it within a few minutes. <laughs> so I'd like to probably assume that my history of wanting to be controversial came from my rather loose canon of a mother. But when I was eight, I used to sort of wear this with a badge of pride, and I used to manifest in quite bullish behavior. So I liked the reaction, I quite liked the attention, and I loved the awkwardness that would ensue. I was liberally, liberally throwing around my quite aggressive, ironically evangelical atheism in a very Church of England school. And I just got kicks out of it. And then as I got older, the bullish behavior started to become slightly more nuanced, and I realized Operation Win Hearts and Minds requires a bit more subtlety. <laughs> and then I got to university, and I thought, bloody hell, science is so badly taught. Science is incredible. And we're teaching it in such a boring way. I was also perplexed by the fact that scientists are writing for publications that probably most of you couldn't even read, let alone access. And I was just getting more and more frustrated, thinking, well, I'm just going to disrupt science then. And I thought, OK, well, so life science is broken, right? OK, uh, what, about, you know, what about healthcare? So I went and read a health economics master's. So that's a year of studying why healthcare is so broken. <laughs> so what does Brexit and Church of England and the NHS have in common? Well, they are really big institutions and ideologies. The NHS employs 1.2 million people. It's responsible for a 110 billion pound budget. But it's completely broken. Yet we wear the NHS with a badge of pride. I don't think anyone else in the world would have nurses and hospital beds in their Olympic opening ceremony. We love the NHS. It's in our psyche. <laughs> but I don't think we realize what a privilege it is to have care that's free at the point of care. But for some reason, we don't question how defunct it is. We've all had to ring up the GP at 8 a.m. and say, hey, massive emergency. I'd love to see a doctor. Two weeks' time. I'm sure most of you have been pinged between referrals and referrals. I'm sure half of you have been sitting in Scunthorpe and wondered, why isn't my Oxford electronic medical record sitting right here with my GP? I don't wish Scunthorpe on any of you, actually. <laughs> so health, our NHS system is so broken, we don't look to challenge it. And so I thought, OK, this is going to be my thing that I really pick at. Where's the solution? So I went into the tech world. The tech world is full of people who live, think, breathe challenging. And I just thought, yeah, every single problem in the NHS could be solved by tech. And I became enamored with this whole sector. The fact that people in technology think, lee, live, breathe, challenge. They always poke. They're always stepping back and thinking, how can we do it better? How can we disrupt? And I even took that into my own life and thought, well, OK, one of our biggest problems is dementia. 
We're not finding a cure using petri dishes and clinical trials. So let's use big data. I'll be a data scientist and try to cure dementia using big data. And so as I became more and more sucked into this tech world, and I was sitting down looking at my super trendy platforms and my MacBook Air and my meal that was free from everything including fun, <laughs> I had realized I became this guy. <laughs> minus the beard, minus the beard. And I just thought, oh my God, I have just become completely involved in the tech world and completely blind. And I was shaking clinicians saying, do you not realize this is the future of medicine? And they were saying, hey, Maxine, we're busy saving lives, come on. And I would shake patients and say, how can you put up with this? There is no customer service. Maxine, like, I'm just looking to get cured from cancer. Please leave me alone. <laughs> we don't think to actually question our healthcare system for some reason. And I realized that actually, I was speaking tech and trying to talk to health. It was actually the gaps in between this where some real innovation was actually happening. So I always like to challenge, I always like to poke, be it the Acropolis that is the NHS or the super trendy tech. To be a rebel without a cause and to challenge yourself just because really makes you sit back and think, why am I doing this? Why does it work like this? What's the point of doing that? So, are you a rebel without a cause? Because this is the breeding pool for amazing innovation and ideas. When Titanic, when Titanic horns crash, that's when in the collateral you find some amazing new innovations. So, are you a rebel without a cause? Because therein lies a fantastic innovation as well as sensational dinner party conversation. Thank you very much. Woo!